seven o'clock. Um, so welcome, hello, uh, good evening, and uh, welcome to our evening meeting here at the, at the Beacon Church. Welcome also those of you joining in on Zoom. Great to have you with us as well. And uh, just to remind us, uh, as we get going, that James uh, is uh, with some of our young people this evening who have their, their own meeting. Um, as you might remember, our, our hope for these meetings is to have a, a mixture of, of scripture and prayer. Um, I'll lead us in, in looking at a passage from the Bible, um, Jeremiah 10. Alan's going to read it to us in a moment. Uh, we got a bit of a long run up to it uh, this evening, but we will get to the passage in the end. And then we'll have some time for a reflection back um, if, we, if we want to do so. Um, and then we'll spend some time praying together again, uh, flowing out of what we see in the passage. And as usual, we will, we will uh, finish at or by eight o'clock. So before we go any further, let's, uh, let's pause. Uh, let's commit our evening to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. God's prophet Isaiah saw a vision of the Lord seated on his throne, surrounded by heavenly beings who called out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Lord, we acknowledge ourselves this evening that you are holy, that you are mighty, that you are set apart from the rest of creation set apart even from those great and strange heavenly beings that we read about in your word who sing your praise, set apart from us in your perfect love and purity. And Lord, we acknowledge as we come to you this evening that we are anything but perfect, anything but pure. And yet, Lord, we bless you and thank you that you've not left yourself separate. You've not left yourself silent. You've not left yourself invisible, but that you've shown your love. You've revealed your glory to us in Jesus, and you've reached out to us to draw us into relationship with yourself. And Lord, we want to say this evening, we are so grateful for that. Grateful for the reminder we had this morning of the death of Jesus in bread and wine. Lord, we ask for ourselves this evening, that our time together would be special and <clears throat> beneficial for each of us, that we would enjoy being in each other's company, that you would speak to us through your word. We pray for the children in the lounge, that your hand would rest on them too for good. And we pray also for James as he meets with Ignite and as they discuss together, there will be helpful time for them as well. We praise and thank you for... <coughs> all that you are and all that you do, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, Alan, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so the reading is from Jeremiah 10. Uh, in the NIV, it's a passage entitled, God and the Idols. Hear what the Lord says to you, people of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by signs in the heavens, though the nations are terrified by them. For the practices of the peoples are worthless. They cut a, they cut a tree out of the forest and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. No one is like you, Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear you, King of the nations, this is your due. Among all the wise leaders of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. They are all senseless and foolish. They are taught by worthless wooden idols. Hammered silver is brought up from Tarshish with gold from Ufas. When the craftsmen and goldsmith have made, uh, what the craftsmen and goldsmith have made is then dressed in blue and purple, all made 
by skilled workers, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal king. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure his wrath. Tell them this. These gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. But God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the waters in the heavens roar. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. Everyone is senseless and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is shamed by his idols. The images he makes are a fraud. They have no breath in them. They are worthless. The objects of mockery. When their judgment comes, they will perish. He who is the portion of Jacob is not like these, for he is the maker of all things, including Israel, the people of his inheritance. The Lord Almighty is his name. Well, thank, thanks, Alan. Um, just go with me a few moments. It's going to bring up some, uh, some slides for us. Okay. Well, uh, as I think pretty much everyone will know, we're, uh, we're looking at um, some passages in the prophecy of Jeremiah in our evening meetings this term under this overall heading of true faith in troubled times. And some weeks back, uh, we introduced Jeremiah himself and his book by asking a load of questions, who, what, when, where, how, and why. And then uh, a week or so later, we looked at Jeremiah's call in chapter one, under the heading of true, true call. And if you're here, you might remember that we said that although Jeremiah's call was unique to him as a prophet of the Lord, it is true of all Christians in scripture that we are called by God. And that means we can read Jeremiah chapter one, and we can see how uh, Jeremiah's call applies to us, that we also receive a call from God, that God gives us his word, his message uh, to speak, and promises us his help. And then just, uh, some weeks later, I think, we, we thought about true religion by looking at Jeremiah's temple sermon in chapter 7. And we said that in our faith, as, uh, as much as anywhere else, there can be a world of difference between the real and the fake, and how there can be sometimes a disconnect between what we believe and how we behave. And that that was the same in Jeremiah's time too. And so especially in the, the first 15 verses of Jeremiah chapter 7, you might recall the Lord's word through Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's stationed to speak at the entrance to the temple um, and the people are coming in he addresses them and he takes issue with his people who were corrupt and unjust in their behavior towards others and yet still thought that they could come to the temple as if as if all was well so we saw that, that they were treating the temple as a kind of lucky lucky charm or a talisman which guaranteed their security the temple had become for them uh, like a robber's hideout where they thought they could retreat uh, to it and, uh, and be safe. And they'd forgotten the lesson from their own history, which is that years ago, uh, Jeremiah said the temple was, a tabernacle was set up at Shiloh, which the Lord had destroyed because of the sin of the people there. So that's what we've, we've looked at so far in, in, uh, in Jeremiah. It's not, not very much really. Um, but we're beginning to get, I hope, a little bit of a flavour for his ministry. So I just want to summarise uh, before we, we move on. What's happening is Jeremiah is bringing God's word to God's people in Jerusalem before, during, and a little bit after the time in the Old Testament history when the Babylonians are going to march onto the city of Jerusalem, they're going to destroy the city, destroy the temple, and they're going to cart off a load of people into exile. So that's Jeremiah's historical context. 
And for much of this time, as we've seen, his message is dominated by a note of judgment of the Lord uprooting, tearing down, destroying and overthrowing his people. And those are the words that God uses in Jeremiah's call to describe the nature of his, his ministry. And he makes it clear why the Lord is doing this. It's because his people have not kept their side of the covenant relationship with him. And so, first of all, Jeremiah says they've been guilty of infidelity. Now, almost certainly some of them had been unfaithful to their own spouses. But in Jeremiah, as elsewhere in the Old Testament, the metaphor of adultery is used. Uh, to describe the sin of, of God's people towards, towards God. So the relationship between the Lord and his people is likened to a marriage relationship, but his people have just played flat, fast and loose. They flirted with other gods. They've committed spiritual adultery. They've been unfaithful to God. So that's thing number one. Uh, thing number two is injustice. Um, we saw this in Jeremiah's temple sermon last time. I can't remember. It seems like ages ago. <laughs> but we saw it in chapter chapter seven that somehow when the people stop loving God as they should, they stop loving their neighbor as they should. And, and we know that one of the one of the features of the covenant relationship with God was that there were people were, were required to exercise justice and righteousness in the land. They were to look after the vulnerable and the poor and the marginalized. Um, and they weren't doing that. And they're called out for it. I'm saying, I'm emphasizing this a little bit because I genuinely think what we've got going on in the early chapters of the book of Acts is the kind of the restoration of Israel in, in the church. And that's why Luke is constantly wanting to, to talk about how the church was reaching out and, and making sure that the needy were, were, were looked after. So what we have is the early Christians kind of fulfilling what Israel was meant to do by making sure that there was no needy a, 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 among them. So it's actually quite a significant statement that Luke is, is, is making when he talks about um, the, the kind of the, the social care program, if you like, that the apostles put in, in place. So they've been guilty of infidelity, they've been guilty of injustice, and thirdly, they've been guilty of idolatry. And that's what we're focusing on this evening. Both Ezekiel in Babylon, Jeremiah in Jerusalem, constantly expose the fact that the people worship other gods than the one they should worship the lord himself and that's our that's our topic for this evening true worship a true call true religion and now true worship so we're going to look at jeremiah 10 which is about idolatry but as i say i want a little bit of a lead into this <clears throat> because i think passages like this always raise some questions uh, for us as 21st century um, Westerners. How do we handle passages like the one that Alan, Alan read to us? See, on the one hand, we might be tempted to dismiss these sorts of passages about idolatry because they just seem a little bit too remote from us. We're not tempted into the worship of wood and stone, which seem to tempt the Israelites. So these passages about idolatry in scripture can sometimes just feel like Literally, they belong to another world, another culture. On the other hand, what often happens when we talk about idolatry in, in church is we go down the line of pointing to our modern day idols. So this is, this is typically um, what happens when the preacher speaks about idolatry, talks about your, your, you know, my car, my stamp collection and my education and uh, my job and my family, and my, my garden, and my money, and my clothes, and all these things, we're told, can become idols. In fact, anything, if it takes the supreme place of God in our lives, is an idol. Now, of course, that's true, but I don't think it always helps us, <laughs> because certainly in my experience, is we don't need a preacher to tell us that. We know that's true. And I do think too often we leave our evangelical churches again, feeling evangelically guilty again, that we're not quite up to scratch, but not quite sure, well, what do we do about that? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, shouldn't we find some security in our families? 
uh, or in our jobs? Is it wrong to have a house or a car or a stamp collection? <laughs> Isn't it a good thing uh, to, to, to try to do our best in education or, or a chosen sport or, or you know, vocation? Aren't those good things? Um, and what I think is we need as Christians to get to the root, the root of the, of the issue. And I do think that Jeremiah 10 is, is able to help us uh, address it. Because this passage as a whole captures two main thoughts, which it hammers home again and again and again. And the two points are these. Number one, these gods are worthless. And number two, whoops, this God is worthy. Um, the same word worthless is used in this passage three times. Um, I'll, I'll point them out as we, as we come to them. Um, it's used to describe the idols themselves and the activity of those who worship the idols. The, term, the word worthless, the NIV uses the same word. It's the same word that's used in Ecclesiastes. Um, you know that in, in the NIV, it's meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, everything is meaningless. And that word meaningless is a really, really poor translation. Um, the, the word is, has to do with vapor or, or, or mist, like something that's kind of there, but it's just insubstantial. Um, so, and this is the same word that uh, Jeremiah uses here, uh, that's translated here as worthless, not meaningless. Um, and uh, the, these gods, says Jeremiah, they're not worthy. They're worthless, not worthy of your trust or your loyalty or your commitment or your obedience. That belongs alone to God. So verse one, if you have a look at the passage, we're going to kind of go through it fairly fast. Verse one provides an introduction and it tells us in case we're in any doubt who the passage is addressed to. Hear what the Lord says to you, people of Israel. So we're in no doubt at all. This is not addressed to the, this is not to the pagan nations. This is addressed to God's people, the people of Israel. So this problem of idolatry is a problem for the people. Um, and what follows down to verse 16 is basically four sections, each making a contrast between the idols and the Lord. So let's, let's see how it unfolds. My headings tonight, on, I'm just warning you, they're not very snappy, um, but I hope they'll capture... Uh, what's what's going on so we begin with the weakness of the idols and the power of the lord so we look at verse two this is what the lord says do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by signs in the heavens though the nations are terrified by them now we know that many in the ancient near east uh, believed that signs in the sky like eclipses and conjunctions of planets and the movement of stars and so on were the work of evil forces. I'm really glad that we don't believe that hocus pocus anymore these days, aren't you? Um, many of them, many of Israel's neighbors, we know, worship the sun and the moon and the stars as, as gods. But God's people are told here explicitly, don't become involved in learning about these things. And don't be scared by them either. Don't fear them. And the first part of verse three tells us why. For, so we're going on to explain now, for the practices of the peoples are worthless. That's the first use of our word worthless in this section, like a mist, like a, like a, like a vapor, like a, a bar of soap that you just can't get hold of in the bath. See, pagan nations might have feared these phenomena, but God's people should have known that God created the heavens and the earth, that God was in complete control. So the moon and the sun and the stars didn't determine the course of their lives, and neither were they, were they to be worshipped. They were and are part of God's creation. They're under God's sovereignty. And so Jeremiah goes on in the rest of verse 3 and, and following. They cut a tree out of the forest, and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. So this is classic Old Testament uh, prophets. People take a piece of wood, Jeremiah says. They work on it with tools. 
They decorate it with gold and silver. They fasten it secure with a hammer and nails so that it doesn't tip over. And then they bow down and worship it. How stupid, says <laughs> Jeremiah. It's like a scarecrow in a melon patch, which is a, another way of translating that bit about cucumber field. It's unable to move. It's unable to speak. It's unable to act. And we can hopefully hear the, this is kind of private eye, have I got news for you kind of satire that's, that's, that's going on here. We know from ancient sources that idols uh, occasionally needed to be taken off to the idol maintenance yard to be repaired. I'm not making this stuff up, by the way. This is absolutely, this is bang up true. Uh, they would be out in the weather, so they would need a coat of paint or something. And before they were moved, they had to be desacralized. Um, and that sometimes involved washing the idol's uh, mouth out with a kind of mouth mouth kind of ancient Listerine type thing and then then they went off to the idol yard to be maintained and then when they came back there was a service of re-consecration and within this kind of context then you can see just how biting Jeremiah's uh, satire and his, his parody is he's really poking fun here now now we have to be we have to be careful here People in the ancient world didn't believe that a piece of stone or wood really was itself the god. The physical object was understood to represent the god. But what the satire is doing is saying that these gods, so-called, are no more powerful than this. Basically, it's a scarecrow, says Jeremiah. And the gods that they represent are no more powerful than that scarecrow that can't walk, can't do anything, can't breathe, can't see, can't hear, because those idols are, are weak. And then comes the contrast in verses 6 and 7. So we've had the weakness of the idols in verses 2 and 5, and then we have the power of the Lord. No one is like you, Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear you, king of the nations? This is your due. Among all the wise leaders of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. So we've got the idols and then the Lord. And the, there's that deliberate <laughs> contrast that's being set up. Unlike the idols, God is unique. God is powerful. He's the one who's king over the nations of the world. He's the only one who is all wise. These idols are worthless. This God is worthy. And then our second contrast is between the dead idols and the living Lord. So look at verses 8 and 9. They are all senseless and foolish. They are taught by worthless, as our second use of the word worthless, wooden idols. Hammered silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Ufaz, what the craftsman and goldsmith have made is then dressed in blue and purple, all made by skilled workers. And so those who worship idols, Jeremiah says, are like those idols. They are senseless and foolish. Their teachers are worthless wooden objects. And even Anthony Billington, you know, is better, hopefully, than a worthless wooden object. The best materials that could be used for their adornment. Silver can be brought from Tarshish. Gold can be brought from Ophir. The most expensive and royal colours can be used. The most skilled workers can do the job, but it all amounts to junk. They're not living gods. They are dead pieces of wood. By contrast, verse 10, but... Notice here now we get the but to make clear there's a contrast, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, says Jeremiah, the eternal king. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure his wrath. So notice again the contrasts. He is true. They are false. He is living. They are dead. He is eternal they will rot. And then in verses 11 to 13, we have a contrast between the non-creating idols and the creator Lord. 
So verse 11, tell them this, these gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. So the people are reminded these idols played no part in creation and they will be destroyed. And then we get the contrast in verses 12 and 13, again with the word, but, but God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the waters in the heavens roar. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. So again, we've got the power of God uh, contrasted with the powerlessness of idols. God is the Lord of creation, Jeremiah says. He controls the weather, very significant, of course, in the Old Testament uh, context. The storm gods of the nations are nothing by comparison. It's God who made the earth. It's God who established the world. It's God who stretched out the heavens. It's God who has complete power over his creation, the rain and the clouds and the lightning and the wind. And then there's a, a final contrast between the foolish worshippers of idols and the wise worshippers of the Lord. So we look at verses 14 and 15 to begin with. Everyone is senseless and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is shamed by his idols. The images he makes are a fraud. They have no breath in them. They are worthless. That's the third use of our word worthless. The objects of mockery, when their judgment comes, they will perish. And so we return here to the, to the theme of the senselessness of worshipping what's made with hands and has no breath. They ought to be mocked, says Jeremiah, and one day they will be judged and they will perish. And just as the idols have been described as senseless, so now here those who worship them are, are themselves described as senseless. But we have a final statement of contrast in verse 16. He who is the portion of Jacob is not like these, for he is the maker of all things, including Israel, the people of his inheritance. The Lord Almighty is his name. So those who worship the Lord, says Jeremiah, worship the one who made all things. And God is described here as a portion of Jacob. A portion is... Um, is something that belongs to someone. That's a language that's used in the Old Testament to speak about the land or, 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 or inheritance. And here the thought is that Israel is the Lord's chosen inheritance. They are his special people. And so uh, the, these titles that Jeremiah uses here about portion of Jacob and, in, and inheritance, they link back to God's choosing of Israel to, uh, to be his people. And the point is, these are the true worshippers of the true God. These idols are worthless. This God is worthy. So I think we can see a hope that this whole passage is organized around this series of contrasts, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, about four times, this series of contrasts between false gods and the true God, false gods and the true God, false gods, et cetera, et cetera. And it's basically structured in a way, kind of rhetorically, if you like, that demands a response. Who will I serve? Who, given what Jeremiah says, who will I serve? Who will I who will I worship? On the basis of what he says, which side are we going to come down? The, one who, the ones who are worthless or the one who is worthy? And in a sense, Jeremiah um, simply states the contrasts between the true God and the false gods. Um, he doesn't really tell the people what to do. He just lays it out for them. Uh, God's people can choose to stay in relationship to the worthy God who gives life and hope, or they can be allied with those worthless gods who have no power of life and who have no hope. And as I say, remember, it's the people of God who needed to be reminded of what God was really like. And that means that I might need that reminder every so often. I know I do. And it means that you also might need that reminder every so often as, as well. 
I want to think a little bit more about this as we as we uh, as we kind of come you know come to a close, and I'll be re reminding us of some things. I'm aware that I've spoken about some of these things with us as a as a congregation uh, before, so I probably will say some things that some of you will have heard me say on previous occasions. Um, but I hope it will be be helpful to to hear again. I, I've been helped in my own reflections on idolatry by um, by these two books: Tim Keller, Counterfeit Gods when the empty promises of love, money, and power let you down, and uh, Julian Hardiman book called Idols, uh, God's Battle for Our Hearts. And both these um, pastor writers um, make the helpful point that really there are two kinds of idols. There are surface idols and there are deep idols. Now, what, what do they mean by that? Well, surface idols are the kind of the obvious things. They're the sorts of things that we were talking about at the start a little bit jokingly. Surface idols are the car, the car that you have, or the spouse that you'd like to have, or the hobby that you spend a lot of time on. It could be <coughs> making sure that the house is always clean. Or it could be actually deliberately not being house proud at all. It could be getting promoted at work. It could be being complimented on by others on having such well-behaved children. Those, <laughs> some of you are smiling ruefully. <laughs> those are all surface idols. In a sense, they're kind of obvious things. And many of those are good things. Many of them are right things. The problem is that we, we want them too much or we want them for the wrong reasons. Because this is, this is Keller's point. Beneath every surface idol is a deep idol. And the deep idol is the need that we're really trying to meet. So deep idols are what lie beneath the surface idols, what we hope the surface idols will give us. And those are things like security and significance and power and approval and comfort and control. Those are the deep idols. So as human beings, we pursue a surface idol whatever it might be, because we think it'll bring us a deep idol. And often that deep idol is, is what we think, that will make me really happy, really happy. I, I, I've been helped in my own uh, thinking about idolatry by uh, Augustine. Uh, Augustine was as you probably know, one of the, the most significant uh, leaders that the Christian church has ever seen, uh, kind of fourth, fifth century time. Um, Augustine grew up in a completely dysfunctional family um, with a devout but domineering mother, a father who didn't want the children to be baptized. As a child, he struggled with uh, theft and dishonesty. Although he was exceptionally bright, um, he was lazy and he hated studying. As he grew up, he became addicted to sex and food and spent a lot of money and time on entertainment. He was drawn to all the strange and weird philosophies that were going around in his day. And much to the sadness of his mother, he ended up living with a woman who bore him an illegitimate son one of the most significant theologians in the history of the church, by the way. <laughs> uh, and after becoming a Christian, um, Augustine was able to recognize that like many people today, he had been searching for all these things, he'd been searching for happiness, basically. And as he saw it, the, the, the quest for happiness involves loving things that we think will make us happy, but don't bring us ultimate happiness, which can't satisfy us. And for Augustine, that was uh, the sex, the food, the money, the entertainment, the intimacy that he, he longed for. Now, Augustine was brilliant because 
he pointed out those things aren't wrong in themselves. For Augustine, the, the, the problem is not the things that we love. It's not always that we love the wrong things, although we sometimes do love the wrong things. We must remember that. But it's more, Augustine said, that we love the right things in the wrong way. The problem is that we make good things into God things, which is idolatry. It's to invest our quest for ultimate security and comfort and happiness in something that isn't God himself. So for Augustine, sin is what he called disordered love. And by that he means we get things in the, in the, just in the wrong order. We stack the deck with the wrong cards on the top because we think that those are the things that will satisfy us and make us happy. And it's not that we shouldn't enjoy good gifts from God's hand, food, family, <clears throat> friends, work money, entertainment, physical intimacy within appropriate boundaries. We can enjoy those good things because they're gifts from the hand of God. We can even love those good things, said Augustine, but what we mustn't do is assume that those good things will bring us ultimate happiness, ultimate satisfaction, because there's only one who can do that, and it's God himself. So I can say to you, I love my laptop, I love my books, I love food, I love walking in the countryside, I love our house, I love our garden, especially that I don't have to do anything in it. I love Emma, I love our sons, I love God. And none of those things are wrong in themselves, but you understand, don't you, that I need to love them the right way and in the right order. We tend to think of sin as doing wrong things, bad things, things that we shouldn't do. But Augustine helps us see sin from another angle in terms of what we, what we love and the need to move from disordered love which characterizes our lives as sinners, to a reordered love, loving the right things in the right way with the right cards at the top of the deck. So famously, Augustine has said, O oh Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Which is brilliant. Unless we do find our rest in God, we will be as human beings forever restless, forever looking for that thing to satisfy us. Supremely, God made us for himself, but our hearts always go after other things and God gets dropped down the pile or left out completely. Now, those of you who did the culture stuff in Sunday evenings, we, this is what we were seeing all the time with the culture stuff. Love Island, even something like Bake Off. You know, these, these, some, these good things where a bit of good culture just gets distorted because we think that will bring us satisfaction. And it may bring us some satisfaction. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not designed to bring us ultimate satisfaction. There's only one who's designed to do that, and it's the Lord himself. So when we're thinking about idolatry, we basically are asking, where's our heart? At the end of the day, where is our heart? Where's your heart? Where's mine? And Augustine would say that the first love of our heart is to be for God himself. And everything else takes its rightful place after that. That means as much as I dearly love Emma and love my boys, my love for Emma and my boys can't come before my love for God. Now, where was Augustine getting this from? The Bible. <laughs> the Bible. You'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And what did Jeremiah and the prophets do? 
Well, they basically say to the people, this is the kind of God that God is. He's the true, living, powerful, sovereign, creating God who's done this for his, for his people. Jeremiah and the others are reminding us that the, that the true God alone is worthy of, of worship. And that's the focus of Jeremiah. That's what he's doing, in, I think, in, in chapter 10. And that's the biblical antidote to idolatry, to be so taken up in wonder and love at the greatness and the generosity and the mercy of God that everything else, it's not that it's not important, don't mishear me, but compared to God, it fades by comparison. So I'm going to stop there, um, and I'm going to we'll, we'll pause there. But as, as with previous weeks, it'd be great just to have a, just a few moments, uh, just 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 to share what we've what we've what we've heard this evening as we've as we've reflected on this on this passage.